So this video's theme is going to be kind of late, but... Hey booktube, so this is the Kennedy video I kept talking about <laughs> that uh, I was planning on doing closer to the anniversary of Kennedy's assassination and some of you might be want watching this and going, is she a big fan of Kennedy's? <laughs> uh, not necessarily. I mean, I don't have anything against the guy, but I'm not like an uber fan, but I don't have you know how some people collect Princess Di stuff or something? Yeah, I, I don't have Kennedy stuff all over my house or anything like that. But I am interested in the era. I think my mom told me she was somewhere in high school age, I think, when, it ha when the assassination happened. So yeah, I kind of tie it to that because I remember, you know, it's, everybody says the of, of her generation says, you know, they all have their where were you stories for that. I grew up hearing hers, <laughs> if you're curious. The short version of it is she was in a high school class and it was announced over the intercom, I think is the, the gist of it. Uh, she tells it a lot better. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not like an uber fan or anything. I'm actually a bigger fan of Jackie, I would say. But anyway, if you're new to the channel or if you missed the video where I talked about it before and you're like, well then why are you talking about it? Uh, I started doing this thing with my reading where I <laughs> have a number of books I want to get through in my library now and one of the things that has been propelling me to read more of them is to put them in themes. I know some booktubers are doing the read five before you buy thing where you have to finish five books before you're allowed to buy yourself one which I think is, is a good idea. I don't know that I could stick to it, <laughs> so this is the system I worked out for myself. I read in themes. Back in November, since the uh, anniversary of the assassination was coming up, I didn't do it as a way to celebrate the anniversary, just to sort of mark it. And as I mentioned in, I think it was my November TBR, I, I don't really have any other Kennedy books in my library other than these ones I'm going to talk about. So I figured it it would give me a reason to knock these ones out and see if I wanted to keep them or not. Will I be doing one next year? I don't know. <laughs> I do know that I am curious to read the Stephen King book that he wrote uh, about the Kennedy assassination. I've heard that that's really good. So I don't know. If I find a copy of that, I may be doing that one next year, but it's not going to be like a annual thing now. So <laughs> anyway, I digress. So let's just get into these. The first one I read was Once Upon a Secret by Mimi Alford, My Affair with President John F. Kennedy and Its Aftermath. And the reason I had picked this up is I had seen a news program um, probably a couple years ago, maybe, where I had heard her talking about the the relationship and, and everything. And something about the way she spoke made me kind of curious about her and the story behind it and everything so and then I and I had remembered they had mentioned something about her working on a book or it was about to be released or something and I was like oh well that might be interesting and then completely forgot about it until maybe a couple months ago I came across this in I think this was at the dollar store actually and I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. And you know, for a dollar, I figured, hm, what the hell, find out what it is finally. And so I gave it a read. It was, it was all right. I wasn't blown away by anything in here. So this is the memoir she wrote of when she was a teenager and she worked as an intern in the White House. I think she said that she had gone to the same girls' school, but she gets an interview with someone in the in the White House to talk about. Jackie to write for her school paper and then that interview to her surprise ends up getting her a job as an intern at the White House and while she's working there basically her job is just to answer the phones and redirect calls and mail and things like that uh, basically a, a desk job in the process of doing that job she says that she catches the attention of the president and 
it starts out she's invited to these swim parties and from the swim parties it develops into a relationship and at first it's just talking and then there's an incident one night that pushes it into a sexual relationship I don't know the way she writes it as far as how their relationship turned sexual at least the first encounter part of me is like well it's it's I don't know it, it is kind of hard to take in these kind of books because there is the element of the person she's talking about is not here to give their side and so you know as far as how much truth is in it you can only take the other person's word and if it actually went down the way she says it went down uh, it just, I mean it seems like she put a little bit of a rosy spin on it sprinkled a little fairy dust on on the memory but to me it seemed like it, it was a bad call on Kennedy's part because there was something to the situation that should have made him stop other than him being married there was another factor in the situation that should have made him stop and say you know what this this wouldn't be right um i'm gonna i'm gonna not <laughs> but he did and so when i read that i was like oh man come on come on <laughs> just i wanted him to be a better man than that the, the thing that struck me as strange though is she starts off right off the bat saying I do not regret a thing I did but then later on in the book she keeps having these phrases where she says oh that I was so ashamed or oh that made me cringe thinking of that and like isn't that kind of in the same bed as regret being ashamed or cringing um, anyway she goes on to, to talk about how the relationship developed and how it sort of petered off right before he got killed, how she kept the, the relationship secret for a number of years. She, she became engaged to be married. Her fiance found out, she confessed the, about the relationship just I think days or weeks before she was supposed to get married. And it ended up screwing up that whole relationship because her fiance could never come to terms with what she told him he could never calmly get his head around it i could kind of understand because <laughs> like what are you supposed to do with that information so she kind of takes it through her entire life but it never gets out other than to her husband what happened her family doesn't know her kids don't know until this one news article comes out talking about how this interview was done that mentioned an intern and then that sort of triggers everything and this journalist goes digging and eventually comes up with Mimi's name and so this book is a result of her wanting to tell her own version of it rather than it being drugged through all the tabloids and she says otherwise she probably wouldn't have gone into it. I thought it was interesting that when she talks about having children and everything she mentions that she actually lost a son to the exact same lung condition that ended up killing Jackie and John's infant son Patrick which I thought was kind of eerie but yeah it was overall though the memoir was it was just all right for me it's, it was interesting in parts it wasn't super riveting I don't know she was flip-flopping a lot it was like you know don't feel sorry for me but then it would kind of be like woe is me and then I don't regret anything but oh this was embarrassing and I wish I could take this back. I think the only part I had a real kind of like oh moment was when she was talking about how years later she had a box at her house that she kept some mementos and gifts that Kennedy had given her and you know by this time I think her kids are grown and she's in like the later phase of, of her life and she's going through all these mementos she was given as a young teenage girl and uh, looking back on all that stuff when and she's describing the memories it brought back up that part made me kind of sad but just in general it was it was all right and I hate saying that when it's like somebody's memoir or life story that is like eh, it's all right but it's just it's not one for the for the save file for me so 
And then after that, I picked up The Empty Glass by J.I. Baker. And this is a novelization of the night Marilyn Monroe died. It tells the story of uh, Ben Fitzgerald, who works as a coroner for the L.A. County Coroner's Office. And he's the guy called in to investigate uh, the bedroom of Marilyn Monroe and, and look at the body and, and do all that. And at first, uh, he doesn't really see anything that's right off the bat alarming. It's just he sees things that are like, oh, that's strange, but doesn't really think about it. It's it's not really until they do the autopsy on Marilyn in, in the novel. And he starts going through the file, realizing that some procedures were skipped over, some paperwork was either never done or it seems missing. And when he goes to ask around and say, oh, why isn't this in the file? Or, or why wasn't this done? It's procedure, What's what happened here? And his colleagues are kind of beating around the bush and say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, that is weird. Yeah, I'll get right on that. And then he doesn't hear about it. And then every time he tries to ask questions, people are like, don't worry about it. Why are you looking into this? Don't worry about it. That kind of triggers his suspicions. He also discovers this, this diary that uh, Marilyn had that it turns out has all these government secrets in it <laughs> where basically she wrote down all the stuff that her lovers were telling her like sort of post coitus <laughs> when they're all on their their high and not really thinking about their filters <laughs> and so she just you know, calmly listens and and giggles and oh yeah that's that's a that's funny, that's a good story, and then goes and writes it down after they leave and keeps it in this book for, she's thinking when she might need something to protect her. And I'm just thinking, if you need a book of information to protect you, you might be with the wrong man or men. <laughs> and I thought it was funny, early on in the book, there is a line that says, remember the empty glass, that's gonna be important later. Really? Really? You think that's gonna come up? <laughs> like, yeah, no, thanks. I gathered that that was probably going to be an important element in the story. That tickled me. But, but yeah, the thing with the glass, that actually was like, huh, that is weird. So yeah, it was pretty good. It's written in kind of an L.A. noir style. It's first person from Ben's perspective. The novel is sort of a culmination of the facts we know about Marilyn, all of the conspiracy theories around her death, whether she did it, whether she was murdered, and just the sort of vibe of that era is all written in here. So yeah, if you, <laughs> I'm not a huge conspiracy theorist myself. There, there are just some things where I'm like, that is odd. Um, but I don't know. There's always part of me that thinks if you dig a little deeper, there's probably a common sense answer that'll come up. It's it's really hard for me to buy into a lot of conspiracy theories. But hers, I don't know, there is a lot of bizarre stuff around her death that doesn't quite make sense. So yeah, this, this novel kind of works off of that. It, and it's pretty good. I did like the the feeling of it overall. It's got that good like detective feeling you know you can kind of picture like you can almost picture it as a black and white movie and him walking around like a trench coat and a cigarette or whatever but uh, it, it sort of started losing steam for me about halfway through where it starts getting more into Ben's personal life and his marriage problems and his wife and him are considering splitting up and they're hashing out and they're having fights over custody issues and all that stuff. Um, yeah, that went on a little long for me as far as, because obviously this book, I mean, it's, <laughs> judging from the cover, it's geared towards people who are going to have an interest in either Marilyn Monroe or just old Hollywood. So if you get too heavy in like, I don't know, marital problems and custody problems, that's a whole different type of book that might not appeal to the people that picked it up thinking they were going to get 
a, a book about 50s L.A. noir. And so, the, yeah, that bugged me. I felt like the relationship stuff with him and his wife went on a bit much and got a bit drug out and a bit whiny. But there is something in the book that ties that into the Maryland story, but still at that point, even with the tie-in, I was like, yeah, you've lost me a little bit. And it also does this thing that, I don't know if I've run into a novel before that does this, but there's a, there's a thing with the writing where it's in first person. You get the feeling that Ben is being detained somewhere. They say he's under arrest, but it seems like he's under arrest and under like psych watch or something. And he keeps referring to the doctor who's interviewing him. Because in the beginning of the book, it, it's, it's starting out with him retelling everything that happened in the past that got him to being locked up. And so this doctor is interviewing him, but Ben keeps referring to him as you. It kind of puts the reader in the role of the doctor, which I thought was was really interesting and kind of cool. But at the same time, it sort of made it a little bit confusing. There, there was something about the story as a whole where it was just, it felt muddled a lot of times. I don't know, it, it just, a lot of the story, there was something to it that felt very jumbled up to where I sometimes wasn't sure what time frame we were in, where he was talking about, who he was talking to. And there are other parts of the book where there are excerpts from what is supposed to be Marilyn's diary, but it's not, there's nothing in the book that breaks it up as a diary entry. It's just written in the same text and style as everything else in the book. So you're in the book reading along thinking you're reading Ben's story and then it takes you a few sentences to re realize that you're actually in Marilyn's diary now because there's nothing that has a date or it's not italicized or anything. It's just the same as everything else. And so it blending together sort of messed with me as far as keeping track of what was going on. And so yeah, there, was, there were some flaws with it for me, but uh, overall it was decent. I will say, just for a heads up for sensitive readers, there is a lot of colorful language in this book. There is one sex scene that I thought was kind of gratuitous given the brief introduction between these two characters. I didn't feel like, I mean, they, they had a friendship, but I didn't feel like they were developed enough in a romantic way to be having as intense a sexual scene as they end up having down the road. I just thought that that was, and it, it was just weird. It it was one of those sex scenes that just felt like it was shoved in there. Like, oh hey, we're having L.A. Noir. No one's had sex. Here you go. <laughs> like, I'm okay with sex scenes as long as they make sense and as long as they jive with everything else that's happened up to that point. I, but I don't like it when it's just, you know, here you go. <laughs> like, I don't need one for the sake of having one. And then there's a couple scenes near the very end of the novel where there's a good bit of violence and some of it, as far as description, does get kind of gruesome. So just heads up on that. Also, <laughs> if you're a really hardcore fan of Monroe or Frank Sinatra or the Kennedys or any of those guys, um, this novel does not really paint a very good picture of them. I know it's a novelization, but as characters, there's none of them go have a very good situation going on. And especially Frank Sinatra, he's really not made a good character in this. <laughs> so yeah, um, just fair warning on that. But it's he's yeah, it's not so flattering. But in, in general, it was it was a fair read. It was another three for me, I guess. And then the last one I read, it takes place a year, I think, after the Kennedy assassination. And it's also a Christmas story, so I'm bringing it back around. <laughs> this is Wishing and Hoping by Wally Lamb. And I think I had mentioned when I 
put this in my TBR that the last time I read Wally Lamb was years and years ago. I read his book, She's Come Undone, because back then it was highly recommended to teenage girls who were body conscious and all that. And a lot of my friends at the time were raving about it, saying, oh, it's so beautiful. And oh, it just, he gets me. And that book did nothing for me. I didn't get what all the hype was about. It was all right, but I didn't see whatever girl I knew was fawning over his. So <laughs> when I saw his name again, I was like, oh yeah, that guy. I hesitated on this. But again, uh, this was another dollar store find. So <laughs> when there's a book I'm on the fence about and it ends up at the dollar store, by that point I'm like, what the hell, it's a dollar. And so I picked it up and this one actually ended up pre being pretty good. I like this immensely more than She's Come Undone. So it was actually really cute. So this is the story of Felix. He's a fifth grader in Connecticut in the 1960s. He's a distant cousin to the actress Annette Funicello, which if you're not familiar with her, I will put a picture of her here. And he also, in the book it says he's supposed to resemble the cartoon character Dondi, which I wasn't familiar with. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so I looked it up, but this is what Dondi looks like. And his parents run a lunch counter stand at the local bus station. And it's it's basically just this small town story at Christmas time. If you're a fan of the Christmas classic movie of Christmas Story. This has that similar feel to it of that era. Even with like the narration it almost reminded me of that. Of just the time period and looking forward to a holiday and being that age. It just everything about it just had that Christmas Story feel to it. And I don't know if the, it saying a Christmas Story was in reference to it uh, having inspiration from that movie, but there were a good bit of similarities between them, I thought. Not necessarily storyline, just overall feel. So Felix is a fifth grader at this uh, Catholic co-ed school, and he and his best friend uh, Lonnie, they decide one day that they're gonna take down <laughs> the teacher's pet, Rosalie, and <laughs> so there's this whole scene of uh, they decide they're going to bring BB pellets to school and they're gonna spit BB pellets through a straw at Rosalie's head. But Felix gets distracted when, when he's doing this because he sees that there's a bat that's flown into the classroom. And so he starts shooting BBs at the bat and the bat wakes up, starts flying around, freaks out the teacher. Teacher was already a little bit emotionally unstable and the bat sets her off and she starts saying it's you know spawn of satan and freaking out and so that the the other sisters at the school come running in when they hear her screaming spawn of satan <laughs> obviously so they they come running in and as calmly as they can escort her out and announce to the class that they'll be getting a substitute teacher very shortly. <laughs> so that part, in, that happens in the beginning of the story and that kind of gives you the feel for uh, Felix and Lonnie being at that age where they're still a little bit boyish but they're starting to enter the puberty stage where the cootie bug is wearing off and girls are starting to become interesting and they're developing their fascination with boobs <laughs> or redeveloping because I think they're probably born with it but then tuck it away for a little bit. And um, along with the substitute teacher coming in, the class also gets uh, a Russian foreign exchange student by the name of Zenya. <laughs> and the first thing Lonnie notices is what he calls uh, Zenya's bazoom booms which is just, uh, I guess, the polite way of saying she's stacked for a girl her age. And so 
all the kids are, are curious about her because she's from Russia, but also because she's from Russia and it's the 1960s, you can imagine their hesitation to get to know her because everybody is filled with communist fear and what if she's a communist? I mean, she's only like 11, but still. <laughs> and so all the kids are afraid to make uh, make friends with her even though she comes in and she's like, hey, what's up? And she tries to be really friendly, but they're all hesitant until Lonnie, he decides he's gonna get to know her and they strike up a conversation by teaching each other swear words and <laughs> inappropriate phrases, I guess, in uh, Russian and English. They start trading back and forth. And then that sort of leads into Zenya being invited to play sports with the boys and they find out that she's great at dodgeball and baseball. So all of a sudden, all the boys are all for her. But all the girls in the class are like, tomboy freak. <laughs> but she finds a way to get to them too. But at first they're kind of mean to her and say that she smells like mayonnaise because she conditions her hair with it and they can't figure out why she eats herring every day for lunch. Uh, but yeah, she, she figures out a way to break through the girls too. And then it, it <laughs> there's a, sort of a competitiveness that develops between Zenya and the teacher's pet, Rosalie, who are both competing for the role of Mary in the Christmas pageant. And then that leads into <laughs> the nightmare that the Christmas pageant turns into because what is a Christmas story without Christmas pageants going horribly wrong? <laughs> I mean, if you're going to write a lighthearted comedy about Christmas, you gotta throw that in there somewhere, right? So th there's that, and then there's also the, there's a side story about Lonnie's mom being really excited about uh, going on this national bake-off show for holiday baking, and then there's a big fiasco with her appearance, and so the family starts to think, is there some sort of, you know, they start to joke that is there some sort of curse on our family that nothing comes out right? So it's just this really cute, heartwarming story that illustrates, you know, that, that sense of chaos and, oh, we're never going to pull it off feeling that a lot of us get around the holidays. But then at the end of the day, you remember just how great just being with your family and friends is and just having them around. So it's just that warm, cozy, you know, holiday family story that I thought was was really sweet. <laughs> there is one part I will share with you that I thought was was pretty funny since I was mentioning that the the two boys in the story, Felix and Lonnie, how they're right around puberty age. There was a part in here that that really cracked me up about how Felix one day tries to ask his dad something about sex and of course you know Felix only being a fifth grader it kind of freaked his dad out because it's they're just going on an errand for Felix's mom and Felix just sort of drops it on his dad <laughs> parents love it when you just drop sex questions on him out of the blue right so <laughs> but he's but Felix is really cute and polite about it and he just says Hey Pop, what's all this stuff about the birds and the bees? I asked as nonchalantly as possible. He'd swallowed hard and taken a long time to respond. And when he finally did, he said, well, Felix, let's see now. I guess the first thing you ought to know is that whenever you get a drink of water from a drinking fountain, you should never let your lip touch the metal because there are these diseases you get, see? I didn't see, but by then we had pulled up to the bakery. Be right back. Pop said and popped out of the car faster than a jack in a box. Five minutes later, he's back with six boxes, a chocolate donut for me and a cruller for himself. Here you go, he said. Let's you and me stuff our faces. Halfway back to the bus depot, I figured out that stuffed faces couldn't ask or answer any more embarrassing questions. Pop's warning about drinking fountains would be the, both the beginning and the end of his sex ed tutorial. <laughs> But I gotta say, Felix got it easier than I did <laughs> when I was a kid. My mom was a pretty conservative Presbyterian. Well, she still is. She didn't really like discussing anything sex related at all. <laughs> and my dad was very much more the 
pot smoking hippie <laughs> type and my dad dropped a 1970s edition of uh, the joy of sex on my lap and said let me know if you have any questions and then just basically walked out <laughs> that was the introduction and then later down the road after i had had some of the classes at school then the discussions got a little bit more in depth <laughs> but <laughs> that yeah that was my introduction i just yeah, yeah. so parents <laughs> find a gentler way than dropping a 1970s edition of The Joy of Sex on their lap because it's a little traumatizing to get it all at once like that. <laughs> but thankfully I figured it out. So that's it guys. That's all I had for my Kennedy issue, I guess. So yeah, thanks for watching. Sorry this took so long to get up and we'll see you soon. Bye.